All right, so now we're doing the Sudoku solver. And to get started with this, you just want to open up this repository link, click code here, and then just grab this URL. And then in Repl.it, just click the plus button in the top right corner, import from GitHub, and whoops, you just want to paste it into here, um, right there, and then click import from GitHub. And what that will do is it will download this repo and all of this code, and it will generate a Repl.it project for us. So this project, in my opinion, is probably one of the hardest um, projects there. And I think it's because it's very mathematical and algorithmical, and it kind of goes way beyond the scope of web development, in my opinion. I don't know why it's really here. Um, so what you can do is you can enter in a Sudoku puzzle like this. You can use the text box on the left as well, and you can add in dots like this to represent an empty cell. And what you'll have is you'll have a grid like this. And if you click Solve, it will solve the Sudoku puzzle right there. If you're not sure about Sudoku puzzle, I would just look it up on YouTube or something. But they're popular, so you'll probably know them. Um, what you can also do is you can change the inputs in here, and then that will change in the text box. Um, for some reason, you should be able to change the input in the text box and change it here, but that doesn't work. Um, yeah, once this is ready, by the way, you just want to run npm install here. And that will start installing the... Um, project for us. Unlike Glitch, I don't think it does it automatically. So yeah, that doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to work the other way around. But yeah, you can essentially enter in um, Sudoku puzzles. It says that it doesn't work for all of them, but um, it will work for a specific number of puzzles that they've specified at least. And then you can press the clear button to clear it. Um, it's it, Again, I don't think it's really related to web development or Express or anything. So but we're going to do it anyway. Um, so in this, what we have is in public, we have puzzle strings, which contains um, a bunch of puzzles in the form of these strings. And remember the empty, the empty cells are represented by these dots. And then uh, we have the solutions that we should check them against. Um, style.css is just a style sheet, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, Sudoku solver.js is a JavaScript file that's been attached to index.html. And this is a client-side JavaScript file, and we're going to be writing all our code in here. So this is a completely client-side app. I don't even know why it's in the form of an express app, because everything is just done on this script. Um, roots, FCC testing, don't worry about that. Tests have not been implemented for this. Um, and then in tests, we have to complete... Um, six unit tests right here and then four functional tests right here and i'm not going to be doing the testing for this project for a couple of reasons and um, one that it's it doesn't count towards a full stack which is what i'm aiming for so i'm not going to complete it to a full extent because the tests take the longest time to do um secondly this js dom thing that they imported for this testing um, we haven't been taught how to do this, and I have absolutely zero idea how to use it. Um, so until I figure it out, I can't really do that. Um, if I do figure it out at some point, I might make another video with the testing for this. In views, we just have index.html, which contains the text box, um, a bunch of user stories, the grid, which is in the form of a table, and um, we also have the um, Sudoku solver script attached as well through a script tag. Um, don't worry about all of these. A readme.md just has some instructions about how to do testing and stuff, which we're not going to be doing. Um, then server.js basically just creates an express app and it just loads the index.html page. So there's not and listens on 3000. There's nothing complex about that. So once you have everything ready, if you just click this uh, run button right here, what it will do is it will run npm install again, but this should be quite quick now that we've um, already done the installation. And then what we'll get is we'll basically get um, the live app link that, that we can then submit. So just wait for that to start up. And there's nodemon installed as well. So every time we make a change, it will refresh automatically. And what you just want to do is you just want to copy this link right here. And then you can go ahead and submit that. And if you submit it, you'll see that there's zero testing whatsoever. So you could just go and submit that right now. But we're going to do it properly and we're going to build this properly. So now that we have our project running, we are ready to get started. All right, so the first test says that um, I can enter a Sudoku puzzle by filling in the text area, which is this um, text box right here, um, with a number or a period to represent an empty cell. So what we essentially want to do is set up a listener for this input changing in here, and we just want to capture all of these inputs. 
And the way to um, firstly select this text box is if you just um, click it with developer tools, we can see that we have an ID of text dash input and we can use that to make a selection. So the first thing you want to do is remember that we're doing all our work in Sudoku solver.js. So after we've um, open the document. Remember, this just loads that um, default value into the text box. What we want to do is first make a selection. So I'll say let text box equals, and then we can just use a document, um, oops, document, if I can spell document, dot query selected to do this. And the query we're going for is, remember that we have an ID, and then we can just paste in the ID right there. So we have our text box now. The next thing to do is create a function to run when the input changes. And I'm just going to call this function text box changed like this. And this is, I'm just going to leave this as an empty function for now. Actually, what we'll do is in this function, um, we'll basically take out all the numbers from this input. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to say let uh, text box values um, equals. And then what I can do is in the text box, um, I can access, I can use the value fields to access the content inside it, which is a string, remember. And then I can call the string split method, and I can give an empty string here. And what an empty string method does when splitting is it basically splits each character. And remember that this produces an array which we've assigned to this text box values. And I'm just going to log this for now. And the final thing I'm going to do is attach um, this function as... Um, to run when the input of this text box changes. So the way we can do that is we can say text box dot, um, and I think it's on input is the listener, and we can just assign this text box changed function right here. And since we have node mon, remember that it automatically restarts, and when it says listening on port undefined, that means the changes have been applied. So if I just refresh this now, and then we look in the console and I change the inputs of this right here. We can see that each time we make an input, um, we have we calculate an array with all the different values right there. And we can start using this to form a Sudoku puzzle. So that's basically test one completed right there. So test number two says that when a valid number is entered into the text area, the same number is applied to the correct cell of the grid. So remember that we have this grid right here and whatever numbers we go into here, we want to make sure that the 81 characters in this are translated to these 81 squares in the grid. So it's like nine by nine um, grid right there. And also we have nine little squares with nine squares each. I don't know why I'm saying that, that's not really relevant. Um, you might be wondering how we can make a selection of all these grids. And the easiest way to do this is make a selection of all these cells in a way that we have 81 cells and then we can just use the same index to translate these across. And if you um, select these cells, you can see that each of these inputs have a class of Sudoku input and that's the easiest way to select these cells. So what I'm going to do is in here, um, I'm gonna, after the text box, I'm gonna say let cells equals, and we can use document.querySelector again, but we're gonna use query selector all because query selector returns the first match um, of our query, but query selector all returns an array of all matches. And we want the class to be equal to Sudoku dash input. So what this will do is it will get an array of all these cells. And remember that once we split it, this text box value array contains um, indexes zero to 80, because it's 81, but we start at zero with all of these characters. And we also have this cells here, which is a selection of all of these cells from zero to 80. So what we can do is just fill these cells. So what we can say here is um, text box values, and we can use the for each loop here. And what we want to do is for each value or each character, we want to basically set um, cells. And then um, actually in this for each function, we can take in the index of the value as a second argument. And we just want to set the index, the cell at that index. Remember that um, at index zero, we'll have this first character. And the cell at, in, and the, at index zero in the cells array, we have this cell right here, and so on. And we just want to set that equal to the value right there. Um, just a quick thing we have to do here is we, we have to set the value field. Remember that this is a DOM selection, so we have to set the value field right there. So if I save that now, 
and we go ahead and refresh this um, and then I make a change here. We can see that they get translated to this um, Sudoku grid instantly. And um, remember that at the start, we load the value of the text area like this. So what we can just do is immediately after we load it in, so after we've set this value, we can call the text box change function here just to make sure that that initial value goes into the grid. So if I refresh this now, um, we can see that we can make as many changes as we like and they get translated automatically to the grid. Um, like this. So now whatever we put into the text box up updates the correct squares in the grid automatically. So that's test two completed right there. So test number three says that I can enter a Sudoku puzzle by adding numbers directly to the Sudoku grid. So what this means is that we can enter a puzzle right here rather than using the text box. And the way we're going to do that is we're just going to set up an event listener for when these inputs change right there. So firstly, I'm going to create a function to run when um, the inputs change, and I'm just going to call this function grid changed. For some reason, um, because this keeps auto restarting, and it's really slow whenever I start typing. I don't know why. And then the next thing we want to do is make sure that we attach um, this grid changed as an on input event listener for each of these cells. And remember that our cells um, we selected right here using the query selector alt. So we have an array of all the DOM values of the cells. So we want to make sure that we attach this to each one. So what we want to do here is say cells dot for each. And for each cell, what we want to do is we want to set the cell dot um, on input to be equal to um, this grid changed function right there. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm just going to say console.log um, grid changed for now. And we'll implement the functionality later. So now that we have that, um, if we go ahead and refresh this, and I make some changes in the grid right here, we can see that grid change keeps getting logged, which means we have the event listener set up correctly for making changes in the grid and we're going to implement it next. So the next test basically says that when we enter um, numbers into the Sudoku grid, we want to make sure that the same numbers appear in the text area. So it's basically what we did here, but backwards. So whenever we make changes to the 81 cells in this, we want the 81 characters in this text box to change automatically. And remember that in the last challenge, we set up a um, event listener for this grid. So we have this right here. And the easiest way that we can do that is basically um, loop through the values of each of these cells and then add them into a string. So we get a string of 81 characters and then just change the string to a string, change a string in here to that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say let um, text string equals and then I'm just going to set this to an empty array for now. Then what I'm going to do is say um, cells dot for each. Remember that um, cells was a DOM selection that we made for all of the um, inputs in the grid, which each have a class of Sudoku dash input. And for each cell, what we want to do here is we want to say um, text string um, equal text string plus equals, and then we can say cell dot value. Remember the value field is whatever is inside the box right there and the cell is a DOM selection. And what we want to do is call the toString method to make sure that we change any numbers to characters. And then what we finally want to do is we want to set the value of the text box to that. And remember we have a selection for the text box right here. So what we can do here is say text box dot value is equal to um, text string right there. So anytime we make a change, we'll loop through each cell, we'll add the value of that cell as a string into this text string, and then we'll um, change the value in the text box. So if I go ahead and reload that, um, and then I start making some changes here, we can see that the changes get translated across automatically into the um, text box. So all the 81 cells here are now connected this way around as well to the text box and I can just make any changes I want and they'll be automatically reflected here. So that's um, this test completed right there. So now we're on to the fifth test and what it says is that the text area should only update 
um, the grid when a whole number between one and nine is entered here. So we want to make sure that um, we just get numbers and we don't get letters or invalid characters or something like that. And the first thing we're going to do is we actually have um, in this, we have a div to actually display um, error messages. And it's kind of hidden away because there's nothing in it right now, but um, we do have this div with an ID of error message. And what we can do is we can just attach an error message there if we get an invalid character. So the first thing I'm going to do is just make sure that I make a selection for it. So I'm just gonna say let error box equals document um, dot query selector. And we just want to select with, um, oops, wrong button. We want to select the error message div. And um, what we essentially want to do is use a regex to check that um, only numbers have been entered. And um, I have this regex right here just to do that. And I'll quickly explain what it does. It basically says that you can have as many characters between zero and nine or a full stop right there, which is the period. So we can just copy that. And it's this basically means from the start of the string to the end of the string. So this means as many as we want. So that's the regex right there. So I'm just gonna copy that. Um, and again, we're gonna be using this in multiple places. So I'm just gonna place it right here. Um, of course, I have issues copying and pasting as usual. Um, just realized that this is, should be error box like this. So in terms of the validating the text box, what we want to do is basically um, just before we start doing anything, when the text box is changed, we want to make sure that we validate the regex. So what we want to do is we can call the um, test method on this regex and then give it a string to test if it validates. So we want to say if and then we can say validate regex dot test. And remember the string we're testing is text box dot value. And if this fails, so this means that this will return false. If it's true, it will return true because if there's digits and dots only, it'll return true. Otherwise it will return false. What we want to do here is we want to say um, error box dot inner text. And I'm just going to set an error message here of something like error um, invalid characters like this. And you want to also make sure that you um, return here. So return basically means that we stop execution and exit out of this function so that um, the grid doesn't get updated later. One final thing we want to do here is we want to basically make sure that we set the, um, we want to clear the error box each time the input changes so that we can check again and the error message doesn't persist. So if I run all of that now, um, and we go ahead and wait for that. Okay, it's listening now. And I go ahead and refresh this. And if I put in um, a character like A here, or like D here, it says error invalid character. If I put star here, invalid character. So if I put anything that um, doesn't, that isn't a number or a dot, um, you can see that we get an invalid character error. And you can also see that the grid refuses to update until I change this into a actual character and now it updates right there. So that's basically um, test five completed right there. So um, this test right here is very, very similar to the previous one. And it's basically doing the same thing for the grid. So if we enter um, a character in the grid that's not a dot or um, it's not a number, we wanna make sure that the same thing happens. And remember, since that we since we're using um, a regex to do this, um, we want to make sure that we intercept it at a point where um, it's a string. And remember that in the grid change function, we create this text um, string right here, and then we set the value of the text box. So just before we set the value, remember that this text string has that eighty nine characters that we're going to assign here. We want to make sure that we just quickly test this. And instead of text box value, what we're testing here is the test string. So each time we change the grid, um, it will empty out the error message. And then it will test the test string that we created. And remember, the test string is created by um, concatenating together all the values in these 81 cells right here. And then if that fails, um, and we don't have just digits and dots, and um, we'll set the error message and we'll return to, and that will stop it before it sets the value of the text box.
So if I save all of that now and um, we run this and we just wait for it to start uh, listening, there we go. And if I go ahead and refresh this now, and if I change this to something like A, um, hang on, that's supposed to be text string right there. My bad, so we just have to wait for that to restart. Okay, so if I change this, hopefully this time, to something like A, we can see invalid character comes up. Um, and then if I change it back to four, it updates. So this basically refuses to update until we have all valid characters. And right now it won't update. But if I change this to something like um, six, we can see that it does update. So we've basically um, implemented this test right there. And that's this test completed there. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can solve this Sudoku program algorithmically and mathematically and how we can generate an algorithm to do it. And our goal here is basically to fill each of these 89 squares with a number from 1 to 9 to make sure that three constraints hold. And the first constraint is that you can't have the same number twice on a row. The second constraint is that you can't have the same number twice on a column. And the third constraint is that you can't have the same number twice in each of these small um, 3 by 3 grids. Um, again, if you just look up Sudoku puzzles, you'll understand these better. And Basically, what we're going to be doing is going through each of these squares, and at each square, we have a choice between um, nine numbers. So we can choose a number between one and nine. And what I'm going to do is kind of use this diagram I've drawn. I did draw it with a mouse, so you'll have to explain, you'll have to um, excuse the text. Um, and I'll try and explain it. If it doesn't help you, fair enough. Um, I think it, I always like to see things with a diagram to tr try and understand it. So one way we can do this is that, remember that at each square, we have a choice between um, one to nine numbers. This is actually, this shows three branches, but we actually have nine little branches here. And then we have square two, which has nine choices and so on and so on. And um, one way we can do this is we can basically go through each root in the tree to get to all of the end leaf branches right here. And we can basically check each of those solutions to see if all the constraints hold. And to do this, we'd have to generate um, nine to the power of 81 solutions and then check all of those individually, which will take a long amount of time. Um, the way we're going to actually do this is by using a recursive algorithm with backtracking and we'll be checking as we go along. So what we'll do is um, at each square, um, if the square is not empty, so if there's already a number inside the square, we can just skip and move to the next square like this. Otherwise, what we do is we'll try with the first choice. So we'll try putting one in. So we'll place one. And before we place it, we make sure that we check if it's okay to place. So we make sure that one doesn't already exist in this row column or the little square right here. And if it's okay to place, we'll place it. And then what we'll do is we'll continue to, we'll move on to square two and then we'll run the algorithm from there. And then we'll place um, the first number and so on and so on. And we'll basically, it'll run recursively through each of these squares and it will basically check if we get to a solution. And if at some point um, we we don't get to a solution, um, which means that we can't place any of the nine numbers because they'll all cause a conflict, what we'll do is we'll basically backtrack to the previous step. So for example here, we'll place one here and then we'll place one here. And then if we figure out that if we were to place one here, we can't figure out a solution here. This would be impossible anyway, by the way, because we can't place one in two adjacent squares. We'll basically come back here and then we'll try with two and then try all the roots with two. And each time um, we know that it's not possible to place a certain number and we can't get any solutions, we'll try the next number. So we'll try here one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. And if we can't get any solutions with any of these numbers from here onwards, we know that in the previous step we made the wrong choice. We'll come back here, try with two and then so on. So at each choice, we have we check if it's okay to place. If it's okay, if it's not okay to place, we try the next number. If it is okay to place, we'll place it and move on to the next square and run the algorithm from there and check if at some point we return a solution. Since this is running recursively, remember, we'll always get the solution return, return, return all the way up to wherever we started it. And if we get a solution at some point here, so if everything is okay, we'll just return that solution. And if we don't get a solution, what we'll do is we'll retract our choice and then we'll try it with the next number. 
and we have a couple of stopping conditions here. So the first condition is if we manage to reach all the way to the 82nd square, um, we know that um, all, of the, all of them are valid and we know that we have a complete solution. So we can get that um, solution returned. The alternative um, stopping solution is when we reach, when we try all um, 9 to the power of 81 roots right here and we don't get any valid solution so we know that there's no solution so we can just um, return false or something like that and the way we're going to implement this algorithm is in a couple of steps the first step we're going to do is convert each of these 81 um, numbers into kind of a grid that we can actually use to check um, and then we'll do that with a nested array where we have um, nine elements which each have a column that has um, the number inside it. The second um, thing we're going to do is create a function to check if it's okay to place a particular square at a particular cell. So what this will do is it'll, it'll check if it's okay to place a particular number at a particular cell, sorry. So it'll check that the number doesn't exist in the row, column or in its little square right here and it will return true or false. A third thing we're going to do is develop the algorithm to actually solve this Sudoku puzzle. And so that's the three steps that we're going to be doing. So now that we know the algorithm, um, again, if you're still confused about how this algorithm works, um, look up Sudoku recursive backtracking solution and you'll find um, probably better explanations on YouTube or something. So now we have the algorithm sorted, we're ready to get started. So the very first thing that we're going to do is basically just add an um, event listener to the solve button so we can start solving and um, when the button is pressed. So the first thing we want to do is just make a selection for this and this has um, conveniently got an ID of solve button that we can use for this. So what I'm going to do is um, up here I'll just say um, let solve button equals and then once again we can use the good old query selector here and then we can just select it using its ID so that's option there there we go so solve button so we have that now and what I'm going to do is set up an event listener I'm just going to minimize these so what I'm going to do here is say let um, solve button pressed like this and this is just going to be an event listener and all it's going to do right now is just say console.log um, solve button pressed and then I just want to attach this function um, to the on click of the button so what I'm going to do here is say solve button dot on click equals and solve button pressed and then what we'll do is we'll fill in our functions here we'll do um, then we'll run the algorithm in this and then display the result when this button gets pressed. So I'm just going to run this now. Um, run this again. And then if I go ahead and reload this page and then we click on solve, we can see a solve button pressed comes up. So we successfully attached um, an event listener for this. So the next step to do is to capture this um, these numbers into a grid-like structure. And remember to do this, we're going to be using a nested array where we have a row for each um, row here. Sorry, an element for each row. And then inside these elements, it's going to be an array of all the column values like this. And I'm going to be creating a function to do this called um, generate board. So I'm just going to declare it here. So I'll say let um, generate board. And what this will do is it will take in an array of values. And so this is going to be um, 0 to 81 uh, values. And it's going to return back a nested array for this. And the first thing we want to do is declare the board. And the board is just going to be a nested array. So I'll say let board equals. And uh, I'm just going to put in this these empty arrays for now just to start off with. So if I just copy this, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. So we have um, an array for each row in here, and then that will contain all the columns. So the next thing we want to do is basically fill out this. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is create a um, variable that keeps track of what what row or what which of these arrays we're filling and I'm going to default that to minus one and you'll see why later 
Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is set up a counter because we're going to be using a for loop for this. And I'm just going to say let i. Then we'll um, create the for loop. So we'll say for um, i equals zero, i equals zero. I is less than um, board dot length. So if I, I really can't type today. So board dot length. So this will run eight times because it starts from zero and then runs until it's less than nine, which is eight. So it runs eight. Uh, it runs nine times. And then we want to just make sure that we increment i in each loop. And what we want to do is, um, sorry, that shouldn't be board dot length. That should be values dot length. So because we want to run this eighty one times, because we're going to be inserting eighty one values into here. And and the first thing we want to do is basically um, check that. So if we reach the ninth value, so I'll show you how this works. So if you say if um, i percentage nine, so this will div this will basically divide i by nine, and it will return the remainder that we have. And if that remainder um, is equal to zero, so this means that i has reached a multiple of nine. Then we want to make sure that we move on to the next board row. So just when we start off with um, board row will be equal to minus one, and then if we do we start off with i equals zero, and then we when we get to when we do this we'll see we'll increase the board row to one by one, so we'll be at zero, and then we'll run until um, i becomes nine, and we're we're working with the um, tenth element tenth value, and we want to make sure that we put that into the second um, row right here. So we'll increase board row, and then when we get to the um, when we get to index um, eighteen, or we get to the nineteenth value, we'll move into the next row, and so on and so on. And then what we want to do is basically just um, say um, board. So that, that's this big array right here. And then we want to access this smaller array, which is at board row. And remember that we start with index board row zero, which is the first row, then the second row, third row. And then we want to say at, um, what we want to do here is we want to basically push to this array. And we want to basically push um, the ith element from the values array. And you'll see how all of this works in a second. And then at the end of this, um, what we just want to do is just to return our board like this. So um, then what we want to do is basically, um, if, if we want to think about where we'll get these 81 values from, remember that we have this um, text box value right here, which is a string, and we can just split it to get the 81 values. So what, what we can do here is we can just, um, in the uh, solve button pressed, instead of logging this, what I can do is we can say text box values equals, and then we can split the text boxes value um, using the string split method to get an array of all the 81 characters in here. And then what we can do is we can create a board with this. So I'm just going to call this original board. And we can call the generate board method, and then we can give it the text box values. So what this will essentially do is it will basically um, get all the characters from this um, as values and then give it to this function. And then what this does is it goes through and then fills the first nine into this array, the next nine into this array, the next nine into this array, and so on and so on until we have all 81 um, characters that have been placed carefully um, and equally into these arrays right here. And what I'm going to do after this is just console log the original board just to make sure that we got the nested array created successfully. So if I do all of that now, and then we start up the server, and it's listening now. So if I refresh this, and we have this Sudoku puzzle right here, and if I click on solve, we can see that we have this nested array structure, and then we've essentially captured the grid that we had here. So we have dot, dot, nine, dot, dot, five, dot, one, dot, like this. And then we have all the rows here. So we have an array for each of the rows. And then the values in those arrays are the values at each column in that row. So we have the nested array now where we can access the rows and columns. Um, and this will be useful for when we're implementing our algorithm. So that's the first step of the algorithm completed now. 
So the next step we're going to be doing is creating a function which checks if it's okay to place a particular number at a particular square in the grid and if all the constraints hold. So that's this part right here that we're going to do. And what I'm going to do is um, create a function for this and I'm just going to call this can place. So let can place like this. And this function will take in a few things. The first thing that it will take in is the board because we need to have the board available so that we can check um, the rows and columns. Um, I'm going to restart this just so we can see the Sudoku grid. Yeah, we want to make sure that we can see the uh, rows and columns. So that's why we'll have that. The next um, thing that we want to do is um, basically take in the row that we're trying to place it in. So we want to take in row right here. Row right here. The next thing we want to do is take in the column that we're trying to place it in. And remember the rows and columns will be the indexes of our um, nested array. Um, I don't know why this isn't loading. And finally um, we want to take in the uh, value that we're trying to place which is this right here. Um, you know what, I'm going to stop this. Um, we'll come back to this. I'm just going to show you the example for now. I don't know why it's not working. Right, so the first thing we want to do is check if um, we want to look through the column and make sure it doesn't already exist in the column. So I'll just talk you through what happens there. So um, what we need to do is when we have a number, we want to check through each of the numbers in that column and we want to make sure that the number doesn't exist already. And if it exists already, we want to make sure we, that we return false. So if we were trying to place 8 here and we look through this column, we can see that 8 exists here and we would return false. If we were to place um, 7 in this column, we look through here, 7 doesn't exist, so we can continue. So what this does is and we have integer i here and we have a for loop and what it does is um, for um, each row so we have remember that i go, runs nine times so board i remember that board is a nested array where each of the elements in board represent the row so we want to look through each row and at that particular column which we took in right here so here for example it will look through each row at column one and um, we'll make sure if if for if on the board at that particular row in that particular column um, So at each row in that particular column if we already have that value right there We want to make sure that we return false because we it's not okay to place it The next thing we need to do is check it through the row So I'm going to copy and paste this and then I'll explain what's happening here so for this what we want to do is make sure that we look through the row and we look at each column in that row to make sure that the number doesn't exist already. So if I was to place 9 here we'd look through each of these and we'll see that 9 already exists here and so we'd have to stop and return false. If I was trying to place 2 here for example it would look through each of these squares in this in this row and it, because 2 doesn't exist already and we can continue. So what this does is we have integer j to run a for loop and again this runs nine times because we have nine columns to check in that row and remember that we took in the row right here so what we'll do is for in that board for that row and um, we'll change j right here which is the um column that we're currently looking at so we'll look through each column nine so we'll run this nine times look through each column and if that value already exists um in the in the row we can return false right there so the final thing that we want to do is basically check that um, in the, we don't have the same value already in these squares. This is the probably the most complex part right here. So again, I'll explain this um, to you. So the first thing we want to do is basically figure out um, where the where the um, the top left part of that box is. So then we can look through it three times both ways. So the way we do this is to get the um, top row of the box. So that will be, if, if we were looking at this element, that will be this row right here. If we were looking at this element, that will be this row. And if we're looking at this element, that will be this row. What we can do is we can just divide um, whatever row we're on by three, and then we can pass it into an integer. So we get a whole number and then times it by three again. So for example, um, this will, by the way, this will return either um, index 0 which is the first row 
um, index three, which is this um, fourth row, or index six, which is this seventh row right here. Remember, we're looking at the top row of the square. So if we were on row two, for example, what we do is we would say two divided by three, which is zero point something. And then if we pass int, we just return the zero part, then we times it by three, we have row zero. If we had this one right here, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, um, this is actually index 5, so if we do 5 divided by 3, we'll get 1 point something, and then we'll pass in, so we'll just take the 1, and then we times it by 3 again, we get 1 times 3, so we're looking at um, index 3 or row 4 right here. And then we have a similar thing to get the, um, the left side column, so we want the left side column of the square, so it's going to be either this one, this one, or this one. And so what we do again is we divide the column by 3, pass it into an integer and times it by 3 again. And this will return either column at index 0, which is this, or column 1. It will return the column at index um, 3, which is this, or um, column 4. And this will, it will return the index, um, it will return the column at index 6 or column 7 right here. So it will return either one of these three, because these are the columns that are on the left of these big squares. And again, um, if we were on this one, for example, so this is index um, 2, we'll do 2 divided by 3, which is 0, um, 0 point something, but we'll pass it into an integer right here. And then we'll multiply that by 3 again, and we get 0, so we're at row 0. If we were on this one right here, what we'll do is, this is column at index 8, so we'll do 8 divided by 3, which is 2 point something, and then we'll pass that into an integer, which will get 2, and then we'll do 2 times 3, and we'll get to index 6, which is this right here, which is the left side column of that. So we have the, um, the top row and the left column of the square. Then what we'll do is we have um, integer k, which looks through the rows, and integer l, which looks through the columns, and and what we'll do is we will basically um, we'll have a for loop that starts with from the box row right here, which is um, whatever this. So if we will, in this box, it will start there and it will go through. It'll run three times to look through each row. And then we have integer L, which starts at the left side column here, and it will run three times to look through all of the columns. So we can search this three by three grid right here. So if we were looking at this one, um, we'll look through each row here, and then for each of those, we'll look through the three columns right here. So that's why we have this um, two for loops embedded inside them. And if at any point, um, if the the um, integer, if the um, box that we look at, which is which is going to be at KL, is equal to the value, then we also want to return false. Um, Again, if you're not too sure, just have a think about what we're doing here again and um, just look through this code and it will sort of make sense to you. The final thing we want to do is if none of these returned false, um, so we're okay to place it, it doesn't exist in the column, it doesn't exist in the row, and doesn't exist in the same box, then we can return true because it's okay to place. So now we have the um, can place function, which basically takes in a bo the board, row and a column, and then a value we want to place in that row and column. It checks um, that it it's the um, value doesn't exist in the column, and if it, that's if that's the case, it will return false. It checks that the value doesn't already exist in the row, and if that's the case, it will return false. And then it checks if the um, value already exists in the small box that the um, cell belongs to and if that's the case it will return false otherwise it will return true to indicate that we can place that particular value at that particular row at that particular column on that particular board so that's the can place function created right there so now we're finally going to write the algorithm that um the recursive algorithm that's going to solve this sudoku puzzle and what it does is since it's recursive it's going to be called solve from cell and what we'll do is it will basically attempt to solve the algorithm from a particular cell so that when we move on to the next square or the next cell we can run the algorithm again so i'm going to declare it um maybe um up here because we need to use the can placed in it so i'll say let um solve from cell equals and what this will take in is it will take in the board um for the sudoku puzzle it will take in the row and it will take in the column and then it will attempt to solve from whatever cell is at that row and that at that column 
And it's if, if it finally finds a solution, it will return the board. So it'll work with this board and it will return it. If, if it doesn't find a solution, it will return false. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, console log um, whichever stage that we're attempting to solve. And remember that since these indexes start at zero, we have to add one to the row and add one to the column, just so it makes sense to a human. Um, so the, f the first thing we want to do is check um, our stopping condition. And we want to check for this stopping condition that we reach the 82nd square. And when that happens, um, the row will basically be at index 9. Remember that we'll be looking through these um, 9 rows right here, and this is index 0 and this is index um, um, 8. So basically, um, each so we'll look through each of these squares, and then remember that when we reach this square, this will the row will be here, and so on and so on. And what we want to do is when we reach um, the row at so after this we'll move the row onto index um, nine, and if that's the case, um, that means we re we got to a solution, and we can just return that board. Another thing that we want to do is when we reach the um, if we reach a column at index nine, we want actually want to do this before here. So if we reach a column at index nine, so we'll look through the columns from zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to column eight. And if we reach if the column counter reaches nine, and we want to make sure that we move on to the next row. So if the column is equal to nine. So if we're trying to run this with column nine, we want to make sure that we reset the column back to index zero or column one right here. And we want to make sure that we move the row. So when we reach column nine here and um, reset the column to here and then move the row down. So that's those two. The next thing we want to do is basically do this. Um, if 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 it's not em if it's already uh, if it's not empty and it's already filled out, we just want to make sure that we move to the next square. So what this does is, I'd, remember that this tries to solve from a particular row and column. So if at that row and column, we don't have um, a period or a dot, which is an empty cell, um, and it's already been filled in, we can't change that value. So what we want to do is make sure that we um, move on to the next cell and try to solve it from there. So we'll step to the next square right here. And the way we do that is we give the same board same row and then we try to move to the next column remember that if we get to the last column the row will automatically increment it in the algorithm so we don't have to worry about doing that here and then comes the most tricky part where we're going to try placing in the values and there's a lot of stuff here so i'll talk through it um slowly so all right so the first thing we do is we have um an integer i here and i is basically going to be to represent which branch we're trying here or which number with that we're trying to place in the square and we'll start i at one and then we'll try until i is nine or i is less than ten and the first thing we'll do is we'll have a value to place and remember that um, since we're working with strings here we have to convert i to a string and i've just put trying with and then the value to place and what we'll do is firstly we'll see if we can place it which is this right here and if if we can place it and it doesn't already exist in the row column or um the square the these squares right here um so if that's the case then what we'll do is for and on that board at that row and at that column we'll assign it to this value that we placed so we'll place the value or we'll move down the branch and then what we'll do is we'll run the solve from cell algorithm from the next square. So we'll in increment the column. And if that's not equal to false, so that means that the board was returned successfully um, and we'll have that board available, we can just return the board. Um, again, this is run recursively, remember? So if at some point it fails with the choice that we just made here, it will return false. And if that's not the case, and we can return the board. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to backtrack. So this means that we didn't get a solution and we're gonna go with the next number and we know we made the wrong choice. So we're gonna replace this back with an empty square and then we'll run the next iteration of the for loop where I will be changed to two and then we'll try placing two and then run it recursively and so on. So that's that. 
So again, um, I'll walk through this, what's happening here. So we'll check if we can place it. So that's this part right here. And if that's the case, then remember, if that's not the case, we'll just run the next number right here. And if that's the case, then what we'll do is we'll place it. So that's this part right here. Then we'll move on to the next square and run the algorithm. And we'll check if that returns a solution, which is where we're checking that it doesn't return false. And if that's the case, then we can just return the board because we have a solution. And if it doesn't return a solution, so that's this no right here. So that's this um, else part right here. We want to make sure that we backtrack and we remove our choice because we know we made the wrong choice there. So at that row and that column, we'll basically set it back to empty. And then what we'll do is we'll move on to the next iteration right here. And then we'll try with two, three, four, and so on. And finally, um, what we have to do is if we didn't find a solution, we want to just make sure that we return false. So once this for loop is finished completely in the first iteration of the algorithm, so if we run this from 0, 0, and this, this big for loop finishes right here, we know that we've explored all um, 9 to the power of 81 trees right here. And if that's the case, we just want to return false because we know that it's not possible to solve it. So one last time, I'll talk through this algorithm. So what this does is it tries to solve it for a particular board from a particular row and column. First, we log at what we're trying to solve. If we reach to column nine, so um, if we're at this column right here, um, we want to make sure that we set the column back to zero and we increment the row. If we reach row nine, which means we're down here and we're at this row right here, um, so that's row 10 or the row at index nine, we want to, we know that we've reached the solution so we can just return the board. If the board is already filled out, so at that particular row and column, if, if, if it's not equal to this period, which represents an empty cell, we want to make sure that, and it's already got a number in, we want to make sure that we um, move on to the next square and we run the algorithm from column plus one. So we move the column along. Again, we don't have to worry about moving to the next row because that's taken care of at the start of this algorithm right here. Um, after that, so if it is empty, what we'll do is we'll try placing each number from one to 10. And if we can place it, we'll place it. We'll run the recursive algorithm from the next square onwards. And if it doesn't return false, and that means we have a solution, we can return the board. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll retract our choice. We'll set this back to an empty um, cell. Then we'll try with number two and so on and so on. And remember, this is recursively. So we'll get the solution, we'll have the solution returned, bounce back each time. And finally, if we exhausted this for loop and we get back to the first choice right here and we tried all of these branches right here, um, we know that there isn't a solution and we'll return false. So that's basically the um, solve from cell algorithm that basically solves the Sudoku puzzle from any given cell or attempts to solve it at least. And it will return the board if it's successful or return false if it's not successful. So one quick tweak that I want to just make here is um, when we, instead of returning the board, if if we find a solution, we can actually return this right here, which remember also returns the board. Um, this works because the board has, has been modified, but this is probably the safer bet to do it. And remember that if it isn't false, it would have returned a solution board anyway. So that's that. So the final thing we have to do is basically implement um, this for the solve button right here. And the way we can do that is in the solve button pressed after we've generated our board, what we can do is say let solution equals and then what we can do is say um, solve from cell. And we want to basically give it the original board that we generated, which remember was the nested array. And we want to try and solve that from row zero, column zero. So we want to try solving it from the first square. And this will run recursively and solve it out completely. And the first thing we want to do is basically check if the solution was false. So remember that it will either return the board if it was solved correctly, which is again a nested array, or it will return false. So what we want to do here is say if solution equals um, false. So this means that we didn't solve it. What we can do is basically um, change, we can basically show this in the um, error box right here. Um, again, you don't have to do this, but um, I'm just going to do it just to keep it safe. So right here, what we want to say is just set the inner text of the error box. 
and we just want to make sure that we set this to um, no solution and we can put a sad face or something and another thing we want to do is make sure that each time we just try and solve it we just empty out the error box just to make sure that this uh, message doesn't persist and what I'm just going to do here for now is say console.log um, solution just so we can see what the solution looks like um, so if I run this now and I go ahead and refresh this and I'm going to just open up this developer tools so we can have a look at the solution. So I think the default one right here is a solvable puzzle. So if I click the solve button now, um, we can see that the algorithm is running and we do have a solution right here. And then the solution, remember, is again a board. So we have a nested array with an array for each row. And then each of, each of the rows have the column. So this is the completed solution right here. So this is what we essentially want to make sure is outputted in this. And the way we can do that is basically iterate through each um, row here, through each column, grab the value, generate a string right here with the solution, put it into the box, and then call the text box change button to make sure that we put it into this grid right here as well. And if I were to change this puzzle to something like something that can't be solved, so if I maybe tweak a few of these numbers right here, I don't know if this will get a solution or not. Um, it might just, yeah, it's returned false. So this one is impossible to solve and we have false right here. And we can see that the no solution part is already working. So if the solution was false, we have no solution. We also wanna make sure that we return here to prevent any further execution after this. So what we wanna do is remember that we wanna loop through, um, if it was solved successfully, we wanna loop through um, each iteration. Um, of the puzzle, each iteration of the solution board. So the, the way we can do that is we can just do this with um, a nested array. And I'm gonna copy and paste it because it would have take, sorry, a nested for loop. So we have um, integer i, which looks through each row. So that's solution.length, remember solution is a nested array and the length of it is the number of rows. Then we have um, integer j, which basically looks through so this will look through all the rows. This will look through each row at all the columns. And it will basically have the solution string right here. And then it'll add basically whatever value is in each cell to the string. And it will call to string just to make sure that we have it as a character. So if we were to just do console.log um, solution string now and save that. And I'm going to just go ahead and... Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and restart this. So if I restart this now and then I try and solve it, um, it will basically generate that um, nested array with our solution. And then it will look through each cell using this for loop. So we look through each row and each column. And then we add whatever is, the, what are the value at each um, element in the nested array to this solution string. And if we log it now, we can see that we have the string with the solution right here. So the final thing we want to do is basically set this inside the text box. And to do that, remember, we can say text box um, dot value equals, and then we can set this to the solution string right here. And the final thing we want to do is call the text box change method, which basically updates the grid with the value in the text box. So if I do all of that now and I reload this, and if we solve, click solve here and then solve this puzzle, we can see that once it's been solved, um, it the solution is in this box and it's also in this um, Sudoku grid right here. So we've finally done it, guys. So we've actually solved, we've actually created um, the method now to solve um, Sudoku puzzles. So that's basically, um, that all of that work was for this one test right here that says I can solve an incomplete Sudoku puzzle. And we've populated um, the correct numbers in the text and in the text area and in the grid. So that's finally, we've completed this test right here and we're ready to move on. All right, so test eight says that um, it's not expected to solve every puzzle, but you have to make it work for all the puzzle strings in the um, puzzle strings JS file. So what we wanna do is just make sure that we tested each of these. So I'm just gonna copy this, <coughs> excuse me paste it into here and then just click solve and we just have to roughly verify that 
um, those strings match yeah and they seem to match so that one seems to be working so now we'll try the second one um so I'll just paste that one in solve it and yeah mm, six nine four three six nine four three all right so then the th then the third one so this is why I said the testing is a bit pointless in this because you, you're testing it with what I should be working with anyway so that's eight five six one eight five six one um, then we have the fourth one right here and it shouldn't just work for these ones it should work for any valid Sudoku puzzle I think um, so that's eight seven four six eight seven four six. 8746 yeah because it's because it's essentially um, a trial and error algorithm um, where we explore this tree so it should work anyway there's no like actual clever stuff behind it we're just trying a lot of different ways and that's eight six five one eight six five one yeah so we basically complete the test eight because we know that it solves the Sudoku puzzles in this puzzle strings.js file. So test nine says that if the puzzle is not 81 numbers or 81 characters basically long, you have to basically put this error message into the div. So what I'm just going to do now is just copy this error message. And the way we can do that is basically check if the length of the string in this text box is 81 characters long. So the way we can do that is in the text box change function, after we tested that they only contain numbers, what we can say is if text box dot value, and then we can say dot length here to get the length of the string is not equal to 81. Then what we can say is error box dot inner text and we just want to make sure that this is equal to the error message. So um, I'm just going to paste in the error message right there. We don't have to actually validate it for this because each of these inputs only accepts exactly um, one um, element. But what we can also do is just to make sure is in the uh, grid change method, just before we change the value in the text box, we can do the same thing here. So we can say, um, Instead of text box or value, we can say a text string. And that's going to throw an error, so I need to correct that. All right, so if we just save that now, and then we go ahead and reload this. Reload it again. Mm, okay, it was just being slow. Right, so if I were to change this now, we can see that it says error expected puzzle to be 81 characters long. Um, and then if I put something else in that comes up. If I change this to an invalid character, that still works. And in here, the only way I can make it not 81 characters is by removing some of these, and it still says error expected. Um, one thing we can quickly need to do is make sure that we return to prevent um, further execution happening. So we want to make sure that um, the values are not transferred across to the grid or the text box if they're not of the correct length. So if I reload it again, I have to keep trying until it decides to start um, and then I change it. We can see that it doesn't update until we have 81 characters. So yeah, so now it updates. So that's basically um, this test completed right there. So we're almost done now and the final test, test 10, basically says that if we click this clear button right here, it'll clear this right here and then we'll clear this grid. So what we first want to do is make a selection for this clear button. So to do this we can conveniently use the um, ID of it which is clear dash button. So <coughs> so what we want to do here is um, after the solve button I'm just going to say let um, clear button and I'm going to use document query selector to get this. So document dot query selector. And we want to select the element that has the ID of clear dash button like this. Oops, there we go. So then what we want to do is basically attach a click listener to this and basically clear it. So I'm just going to code in this function right here because it's quite small. So we want to say clear button dot on click equals and what we want this function to do is first empty out the text input so I can say text box dot and then value and then I can just set this to an empty string next thing I want to do is make sure I clear out all of these cells so remember that cells is a query selector all array of the DOM selections of all these um, cell inputs 
which is these right here. And what we want to do is for each cell, we just want to set the value of the cell to an empty string like this. So if we save all of that and we wait for it to restart, if I refresh this now and I click on this clear button, Okay, so I just figured it out exactly why it wasn't working. And it's because instead of on click, I had on lick here. So just my stupid mistake. If I save that now, it still comes up as green for some weird reason. But if I reload it now and um, I click the clear button, we can see that both the grid and the puzzle string here have been cleared. So that's basically test 10 completed. And we've completed all the tests um, for this project. Remember that I'm not going to be doing the testing. I might do them in a later video, but for now, I'm not going to do these. Um, so what I'm just now going to do is just basically add some styling and stuff to make this look a bit nicer, and then I'll come back. All right, so I've added some CSS styling now. And then in the index page, what I've done is I've removed most of the user stories and stuff like that, and I've just kept the um, table and the... Um, the box and I'm just organized them using a flex box a little bit and I also found out that Sudoku actually comes from Switzerland and not Japan so I have this nice um, Switzerland background there and it still works as expected you can put in a, a string here and then click on solve and you can have the grid right here um, if you make changes in the grid they automatically update in here we still have error messages coming up right here and they should be able to solve um, any Sudoku puzzle so I've just used this um, website to generate a Sudoku puzzle for us and I'm going to try doing this. This is apparently an um, expert difficulty so we'll see how it works. So if I paste that in now, click on solve, we can see that it gets solved. Um, if I mess about and change a few of these numbers here, it might not be solvable and then if we click on that, um, we might have to try this again. Um, yeah, we can see that no solution has came up now. So it, it's basically fully functional and you can go ahead and submit that now and move on to the next project. Um, I know it was really, really hard, um, but at least it's over now so we can now um, move on.